Peace and blessings to you. It's two minutes past the hour of 12 o'clock at 900 a.m. WURD. Good afternoon. Fatima Ali here with you on the Caramoose, sitting in for Dr. Richard Cooper, along with my producer, Tiffany Gillum. We've got a lot to get to. Short time to get there today. Uh, we're going to talk about a range of things, including the economy. I don't know how many of you um, read the Philadelphia Inquirer, but Jane Von Bergen, who is one of their business writers, just did a series profiling, I think, 50 people who've been unemployed for a long time. And I was reading the conclusion of that series. It was really, really good uh, the other day. And it turns out that a number of the people who'd been unemployed, who were well qualified, who did not have either full time work or permanent work or who were laid off, got fired, whatever, you know, this economy has gone bust, were hired through her column which is a wonderful, wonderful thing. I find it very depressing to be in Philadelphia and not fully employed because jobs are tight. I'm telling you personally, I know this to be true. And I was talking with my producer here, Tiffany Gillum, about that. Tiffany is a college graduate from Penn State. She's a producer here at WURD. And I'm trying to encourage her, don't get upset, Tiffany. Don't get upset. Keep doing what you do because it will break for you. I'm, I'm here to tell you from personal experience. When I first got into radio, I worked for free for three years learning my chops. Okay, so I want to welcome you to the air and I want to tell you don't get upset. Don't get defeated. Don't get depressed. Okay. I know, but it's just like when you read the paper and you see um, people who have like three decades of experiences and, you know, they have nothing but um, degrees and, and just been in the workforce for a long time. And they're more of a liability than an asset when it comes to these businesses nowadays when they're not really trying to pay um, a person at the full range of what they deserve. And you have people like Bob Casey, uh, 53 years old. He was laid off, um, sold his dream house before going to foreclosure. His family, his wife and son lives with his sister-in-law and his son is unemployed at the age of 20. Then you have another person. She's 48, Vincent uh, Tricombe. She's un she's an unemployed silver silver sil silver engineer. Um, her income was about eighty three thousand a year, and now she's working at Wawa for nine dollars. So it's like when you look at the generation ahead and you're seeing how they're treated and you know when you go to uh the governor address where he say you know it's a due diligence that we must treat our um citizens better and you know you have people who went to school and 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 did the right things and and they're like suffering and trying to make it through this economy just even a wrd listener um her name is lady where i built a relationship with her went to see her she's like living without hot water right now because she was working for a law firm she went to college she got laid off mm -hmm. so now she's working at a job that she's not even getting health benefits she's working at an hourly rate just to make it and it's like this is more of a survival mode than coming out looking for a career you're more so just going into a job position i want you to know that i know your pain okay I personally know your pain. A lot of our listeners know your pain. I always say, and you know, uh, my mom is my best friend, and she is my mentor in many, many ways. Her mentality is of the 50s and the 60s. She is always thinking, you know, job, job, job. And I am always saying, yes, that's fabulous. Job, job, job. But they ain't out there. Okay? Entrepreneurship is where I'm headed here. I think that... You should not give up, Tiffany, and anybody else out there. You have to be creative. That's what I'm saying. I could definitely say if it wasn't for, you know, my father who gave me that hustle mentality. Mm -hmm. I mean, I went to a vocational school. I went for hair. Now, 
Beings though, I didn't finish it because I wasn't confident in my academic. And I was like, you know, not really good at reading and writing. So I went to college to better myself. So it was like, you know, I could have became, I, I could have, you know, did the entrepreneur thing, but it would have been like, okay, do I make money and not be well informed or be educated? So it's like coming up through the public school system is some. It, it will come together. Please <laughs> trust me, trust me, trust me. It will come together for you. Okay. And speaking of which, we have on our newsmakers line, Norm Bond, who is the president of National Alliance Market Developers. If you were listening to Thera Martin Milling yesterday with her Word on the Street segment, you know that there was a big time press conference yesterday. OIC of America um, launched a new strategy to help people develop entrepreneurship. Norm Bond is an entrepreneur. He hustles, let me tell you. Uh, good afternoon, and thanks for joining us here on WURD. Good afternoon, Fatima. Thank you for having me, and also good afternoon to Tiffany, uh, a top flight producer. So she was so excited when I said you were going to be here, and you know what this is about. I mean, you know about entrepreneurship. I'm not saying that people should not go to college, not go get their MBA, not go get whatever, However, I think that we are giving our children a young message, the wrong message, if we teach them only to think about working for corporate America. Absolutely. Well, you know, it's interesting. When I was in college um, at University of Pittsburgh, one of the speakers we had was Dick Gregory. I would think I was like a sophomore, junior. And um, the message he gave that day, he said, if you can't find a job, make a job. And never has that been more relevant than today because – with the economy that we're seeing, with the unemployment rate, with the underemployment rate, with the uh, discouraged workers who are not even bothering to look for jobs, that you're going to have to be entrepreneurially minded at a minimum. Because even if you work for uh, on a company today, they still want you to think like an entrepreneur. That, that's going to make you more marketable. Uh, so even if you don't go through starting your own business, you want to develop uh, uh, that mindset of you know, being, uh, you know, having a, a, a mindset of how do I do for myself? How do I find an opportunity? How do I find a hole and fill it? You, you look across the landscape of, of issues within the black community, and there are lots of issues, but the entrepreneur is basically someone who looks at that and sees an opportunity. You know, instead of complaining and, and, and wringing their hands, as, as Reverend Leon Sullivan would say, you know, we, they, they get busy and they, and they do it, you know. And, and that's really what uh, entrepreneurs do. They solve problems, and they solve them for, you know, a profit. And the profit, it could be uh, economic profit, but sometimes it's the it's a psychological. You know, some people, you know, get they, they start nonprofits or they do things that, you know, make them feel, uh, you know, psychologically uh, rewarded or, or because maybe a family member suffered from some particular disease or illness, they'll create a, a foundation or something in that regard. So uh, the, the whole mentality of looking at the various uh, underserved areas within uh, America, and, and today you can look globally, uh, and finding those holes and then figuring out how do I fill them and how do I fill them with a team of people is really what the entrepreneurial mindset is about. And, and, and I think within the black community, uh, we need that mindset today more than ever. I think that's absolutely true. And I always look to, uh, first of all, let me just be real clear politically. I resent the term third world. OK, because mm -hmm. I say mm -hmm. we're the first world. First world. That's so right. if we Go look back in history and read exactly <laughs> if, if we look globally at people of color yeah. and I don't care if they're brown, red or yellow, mm -hmm. what we find is that people of color throughout the world, throughout the African diaspora, throughout the continent, throughout the islands, throughout Asia, their mentality is to be entrepreneurs. When I, I went to Zimbabwe, Absolutely. what, like 18 years ago, mm -hmm. and I had little children, like seven years old, coming and selling me their wares, things yes. that they had made. I was so impressed. And and they were willing to barter. I remember leaving Zimbabwe with like $3 in my pocket, no lie, because <laughs> I just spent every penny. Jeans, uh, they were like, you know, we'll trade. Oh, my, yeah. right. You know what? Same the, in Ghana. I was in Ghana. I had the exact same experience a few years ago. You know, from the time you land, they, you know, they stake out the hotel. They mm -hmm. follow your tour bus. I mean, it was it was great. And that's oh. why when people say black people don't want to be entrepreneurs, I'm like, you know, you have, you know, they've been miseducated as to really, uh, you know, our, our true natural state of how we operate. Exactly. And you know, a lot of people, and there has been a lot of conflict, specifically with uh, with people from Asian countries, here in Philadelphia in particular. But you know. 
I've never had a negative experience, maybe because I'm always a customer, you know, for manicures and things like that. But what I admire about whether they're Chinese, Korean, Vietnamese, or whatever, is that they don't come here looking for jobs. They come here and open their own business. And um, same thing with West Indians. They come here and they open their own businesses. And I think we need to just gear our young people to get their education. I tell my kids, look, go to college. Go get your advanced degrees past college. Think about being an entrepreneur afterwards. Go get your corporate experience and bring that into your own business. Absolutely. I think that's wise advice. I mean, I'm, I work for IBM. My first job out, out of college, you know, I worked for IBM as a marketing rep. And the thing, uh, you know, about those experiences, they're great because you get to learn on someone else's nickel. Um, you get to see the, the best practices, um, you know, but I knew, you know, going in the door, I was, I was like, well, I'll be here for five years, you know, max. I mean, that was what I thought going in. I had that mindset. I ended up, you know, staying for like four and left. But, um, you know, then you get some people, they've been there for 30 years, and, you know, and and that's fine. I mean, it, it, you have to follow your passion. And, and I mean, I've met people at IBM who had created like 20 patents for IBM. And I would say to some of them, you know, had you ever thought of doing that for yourself? And some of them, it never crossed their mind or they felt more Fear. comfortable underneath that umbrella right? Fear. of IBM. But imagine if that same person had those 20 patents in their own name. But entrepreneurship is tough. I mean, it, you know, and, and that's what we're talking about, like you're saying, fear, because the reality is most businesses fail, you know, and a lot of, but but then you look at, well, why do they fail? And also, as, as Art Taylor was sharing yesterday at the press conference, failure is normal. I mean, Donald Trump has failed. I mean, as fa- most entrepreneurs fail, but in the white community, they understand that they can bounce back up and start another business. A lot of these uh, successful entrepreneurs, if you do research on them, you'll find this the business that they become famous for might be their eighth or ninth or tenth business. Mm-hmm. And see, whereas, and so if you just, we don't even get in the game. We don't even try to start one business. Or so if you start that one business and you fail and you, and now you, you know, you wear that like a, like a 500 pound anvil around your neck, you're never going to start business. And, and, well, we, you know, were talking about yesterday even is that the entrepreneurial mindset is one that starts to understand that and starts to understand that, you know, take that idea and push it. And even with young children, you know, you see young children that have talents, they like to do certain things, you know, encourage that. Like, how do we spark that? How do we continue to develop that and then turn that into a business? You can turn that into an idea that can be developed even within the family. And then you can start looking at uh, building generational wealth around an idea um, that really was could have been a hobby. I mean, look at Mrs. Fields cookies. I mean, that was Mrs. Fields started you know? in her kitchen, right? And, and then she Andy got her Ann's. kids involved, right? Look at Andy Ann's. Um, you know, a lot of people, you know, see them. You know, this now, you know, that franchise. You know, but it starts with you know somebody's recipe or something that you know something that somebody you know does. And I often say that if you start even within your family, like we, you know, black community is big on family reunions, but how many family reunions do you go to where someone is sharing, uh, there's a session of that uh, family reunion an hour where we're going to talk about business opportunities um, or businesses that people within the family have already developed? Because most of us have entrepreneurs right within our family. I mean, every, any family you talk to, you got somebody in that family that started something, they're doing something, but often we don't really know the details of what that person is doing. So what if, you know, you embedded that into your activity? You know, we're going to let them just talk about it. And if, is there a way to come and work together creatively to fund it? Because, of course, you know, your business, you need staff. You need people to fund your business. Uh, but the way banks are treating a lot of the black community, they ain't going to get the money from the bank anyway. <laughs> but but how right. can you then come up with creative ways? Because that's the other thing. You see the Asian community is, and, and other, even not just the Asian community, but even people from the continent will come together and find ways that they can share finances. You know, there's a big, a big thing with business is trust, you know, and networking. How do you share resources? How do you share information, opportunities? And see, a lot of the things that stops black people from really building businesses is, is the psychological. Is that, you know, we, if, we, if you're programmed not to trust each other, it's going to be very difficult for five people to come together and work together together and build a business. But forget about the paperwork. I'm just talking about, you know, how do I get somebody who's good on marketing, somebody who's good on bookkeeping, somebody who's good on planning, somebody who's good on technology to come together, no paperwork, and say, here's an opportunity. We're going to work together collectively to go after this and develop it. That's the business. Now, yes. the paperwork is, is needed later, but if you can't trust each other at that point, even if you have the paperwork, your business is not going anywhere. 
Exactly. And uh, trust and um, faith. I think faith oh, yeah. is like really Absolutely. key to that. Yesterday's announcement uh, by OIC was not about being funded. It was about fundraising efforts for the entrepreneurship initiative. Now, you talked about families uh, helping you find seed money and things like that. Yes, yes. Well, Reverend Sullivan, I mean, yesterday was like a historic day. And certainly I want to thank, um, you know, mentioned, you mentioned Thera Martin, uh, Milling, and, and just really uh, all of the WRD listeners who are always supportive. Uh, and, of course, uh, you know, the, coming down to Historic Progress Plaza and seeing, you know, um, a result of faith and seeing, you know, this, this, this uh, plaza, which was the first black owned plaza in the in the in the country, you know, developed by Reverend Leon Sullivan, uh, with his ten thirty six plan where, you know, he asked people to give up ten dollars for thirty six straight months. It was a, a sacrifice, it was a, a part of a shared vision and, and part of delayed gratification. And so what we're doing, uh what was announced yesterday is really bringing those principles into the 21st century um, to fund this OIC, using OIC-10 as a fundraising vehicle. And the, and the goal is to, to, to turn $1 million $10 contributions, and these are one-time contributions, into a $10 million endowment. So we'll take, you know, each person can, uh, you know, basically put in $10 one time, and we, we feel that we can get a million people to do that. We turn that into $10 million, and then that will be an endowment. And from that $10 million, we will then get uh, matching funds to the tune of $10 million each from nine other sources that would give us a $100 million endowment. And by endowment, that means that this would last for for uh, in perpetuity and forever. It's so similar to the approach that a lot of, of colleges take when, you know, you see them endow a chair at, at a particular department at a college, and it goes on and on and on, and you're basically operating off of the interest of the principal money that was raised. And so that's, that is what this effort will do. It will be able to allow us to, in perpetuity, fund a effort to create a mindset of entrepreneurship within the black community from, uh, you know, from cradle to the grave, as it was mentioned yesterday, you know, because we, we want to start it, you know, there's no age limit in terms of who who's too young or who's too old. But the, um, the that part in terms of the programming will begin after we have successfully raised the funds, because as was mentioned yesterday, often we start efforts and, and the funding is not in place. So this is very critical at this juncture that we, you know, we raise the funds and that, you know, we show that we can do for self. Like Reverend Sullivan, of course, was a, a, an OIC has always been about helping people help themselves. And that's what this is about. If we can show from one million people that are willing to put up their $10, that's a vote of confidence in what we're doing. And then from demonstrating that, then we can go out to a broader community. But our focus right now is to have people, um, you know, be able to put in this ten dollars, and we got a variety of ways that they can do it, including um, even from their mobile phone. Uh, they can text OIC to four one zero one zero. So you can text OIC to four ten ten from your mobile phone, and you can actually uh, donate ten dollars to this effort, um, as well as visit their website at www.oicofamerica.org, and you'll see a, a lot of information there, and you can also click on the OIC button on the site and be able to donate. Go ahead. Well, Norm, well, Norm, yes. I have a question. So how do we target the younger generation? I mean, do we have to, you know, go into the community and the community centers to create this forum so they can be well informed of how they can invest just $10 into their future if they want to go down the entrepreneur route? Yeah, well, I think the way you target the younger community is I think that you have to have them engaged and involved, you know, and one of the great things yesterday was that we did have, like, a lot of young people out there in terms of uh, media, even young, you know, because, you know, today there are a lot of, uh, you know, people are doing media over the web, you know, you've got people who are, are putting out blogs, and so, uh, and, and, and it can be very targeted. So one of the things that, you know, we know is that we want people to be able to connect to OIC. Because, you know, Reverend Sullivan started back in 1964. And one of the things I think that, uh, you know, it, it holds our community back is that we often don't share information. Like, like you, I, I'm, I've been amazed at how many young people are not familiar with Reverend Leon Sullivan and, and OIC. Uh, and yeah. certainly their parents and their grandparents are familiar. But who dropped the ball? and 
passing that information. I mean, I'm not talking about I'm not talking about Batahu Tef here. I'm talking about Reverend Leon Sullivan. Right, but you know what? Um, I I will say that there are a lot of people, not just Reverend Leon Sullivan, but there's a lot of late greats that young people are not familiar with Absolutely. that are perhaps excluded, especially in the African-American community. Absolutely. And I can speak for one of them. Uh, it took for me to just make the transition into talk radio because most of our younger uh, listeners are into FM radio. So they're not about being informed or who was the legends that created, a, a, you know, a legacy um, that was ahead of us. So, But they could tell you who Lady Gaga or Lil Wayne why, or any of those people but are. why is that? But see, if you ask yourself, why is that? And then if you ask yourself as a business person, how does that hold you back? Because see... That consciousness of who you are, that is a that is an asset to you as you go about doing your business. Because if you understand the struggle that a Reverend Leon Sullivan with, went through, or if you understand the struggle that a Marcus Garvey went through and how he lost millions of dollars and how his organization was infiltrated and how the government attacked him, when you then start your business, you're like, well, you know, I lost, you know, 10 grand. It's like, put it in perspective and, and, <laughs> and into context. See, a lot of people who, you know, they come out thinking that, you know, it's going to be about rugged individualism, which is a lie that's sold to them by, you know, the media in some ways. Because even if you examine uh, the top white entrepreneurs, you examine Bill Gates, you examine Steve Forbes, whose father started Forbes magazine. You examine Donald Trump, who went bankrupt and got loans and talk about handouts. He got, you know, bailed out. How many of his, his casinos have been bailed out by the government? These guys have failed over and over again. But the point of it is, when you, if they also know... They have a tie, you know, they have a sense of their history and, and, and their culture. And I'm saying for African Americans, if you understood what people, what some of our entrepreneurs went through to get there, when, you know, you wouldn't be so inclined to think that, you know, you, it's going to be a, a just step into the Rose Garden situation or I can just get out here and sell drugs and hustle. Or, you know, no, we have solid businesses and business owners and history that could be an asset to you as an entrepreneur. But we have to, within our own community, educate our young people about those people and that's how i think tiffany you start to bring some of those young people into the into the dialogue you know and one of let the them things, know you're not the first one to come down the pike with a, with an with a idea and you also need to know anybody that's listening and i would like our listeners to join us norm how long can you stay can you stay with us another 10 minutes i can stay as long as, as you would have me. okay that's I'm a wonderful my thing calendar for WRD oh and, that's a wonderful <laughs> thing because i want you to explain to us how uh the national alliance of market developers uh works and helps people facilitate or learn or be educated or however it works but um i do want to i have to interject some bad news here to you and to the rest of our listeners and and uh norm if you need to take a second to uh absorb this news uh you, you know you're welcome to do that but grace sullivan has passed uh for anybody that doesn't know grace sullivan is the wife of the late dr reverend leon sullivan i'm sure that thera martin milling will come in and give us a full uh, discourse on her um I don't know that much about Grace Sullivan, except that she backed her husband, Dr. Reverend Leon Sullivan, for many, many years. But she raised some fine children, too, who are of that spirit. And anybody that knows about a good marriage and a good a good marriage that's a marriage built on faith, which Dr. Sullivan stepped out on faith when he founded OIC. That is very clear to me in reading that history. They have to have a strong partner behind them if there's a family endeavor. And so we just got word that Grace Sullivan passed away, and I just want to extend my condolences to the family, to the extended family of OIC, and Thera Martin Milling will be in here to talk more about that. I want to go back to my opening a statement, which was that my mom and I have this ongoing debate. My mom is, uh, is my hero in so many ways, but uh, she is of the mindset, like many from her generation, that the only way that you make it, the only way, is to uh, get educated and get a job, which is wonderful for some people. But for some people, it doesn't work. And uh, I think, like I said at the beginning, we have got to expound on the idea to our young people that, yes, jobs are good, but jobs are not promised. You can forget about that 30 years ago watching a retirement party 
and some in some cases the pension you know and uh, who knows with tiffany's generation it might be no social security we don't know what's in the future if you are not born into wealth if you have to work for your for your meals then you need to start thinking about what can you do that will um add to your salary i just let me tell you i i, I always say i've had a you know i've been a 30 year journalist and had a very difficult road to hoe is that how you say it? You did it right. <laughs> Road to toe. <laughs> Road to hoe. Um, recently, I had a job that I absolutely loved. And through no no fault of my own, a 25-year-old, you know, whose mother is a board member of this nonprofit, you mentioned nonprofits, you know, felt threatened by me. And so there went my job. But in the course of that job, I got to meet some really wonderful entrepreneurs, and uh, I will be dealing with them outside of that organization. But the point I'm making is that no matter what, there's always politics that plays into it, too. Tiffany and I were talking uh, uh, off mic about when you are on the job search and what that means. You know, these days, there's not actually a human being making the first cut. It's a computer. And they are looking for things on your resume like degree, age. You know, I was reading in, in this Jane Von Bergen article that I was uh, I was mentioning earlier from the Philadelphia Inquirer, her series on unemployed people. Uh, one thing that I read recently was that there is in the computer code to find out what your age is. So you need to not put down what year you graduate from high school or college because they aren't looking for people like me. I had a, a CEO recently of a huge corporation, like one of the biggest employers in Philadelphia, tell me straight up, as a friend is what she said, no one's going to hire you, you're too old. Now, I'm 54. If a 25-year-old who doesn't know her head from a coal in the ground can get me fired because she feels threatened, imagine what it's like being out here looking for a job within the back of my mind, someone saying, you're too old, no one's going to hire you. Tiffany was whining and saying that she's almost aging out because she's not <laughs> 22 or 23. You know, it's the tough. nerve of her. The nerve of her. <laughs> so I say all that to say, hey, you have to think off the chart. You have to think outside of the box. What is your passion? You know, what do you love to do? What, what do you love to do that you would do for free? One of the things, Norm, that I've been um, observing is that one of the biggest black businesses in this country, specifically in Philadelphia, has always been the funeral business. You know, people going to die. So that is a solid stock business for a family. But more and more black families, I've observed, are selling their businesses because their children don't want them. They inherit these multi-million dollar funeral enterprises and the children don't want to do that. And so they're selling these businesses, you know, to other people. And uh, and that leaves sort of a hole and an opportunity for someone else to become, you know, morticians. Yeah, yeah, and that's a big point. And, and also, um, they're targeted. You know, a lot of times, you know, what we have to understand as a community is that, you know, it's about competition. And, and, and America is a capitalistic system where people look out for opportunities and they look to, you know, exploit them for a profit. And like you said, people people are going to, you know, people are going to die. And um, just like there are other industries um, um, as well, and that if we don't protect those industries, other people will come in. I mean, even recently with the uh, the business of hair, you see the same thing. You see where, uh -huh. you know, there's like these fantasy hair shows and a lot of things that were related to black culture. Um, I often say that we're like a manufacturer, you know, as a people, like we manufacture things, but we don't get paid. You know, we don't we don't collect the revenue on the other end. I often our our uh, creativity, whether it's in, um, you know, you mentioned the funeral business, you can mention, um, you know, the hair, uh, fashion, things that that start within the black community, often within, you know, within the inner city, the you know, the poor, you know, the ghetto, however, you know, at the, at the low, these, these creative ideas that are started there often wind up on Madison Avenue or on the cover of magazines or TV shows or reality shows today, uh, websites based on 
that creativity, even the language, the slang even that, that, that is used, that becomes then turned into multi-million dollar, multi-billion dollar, you know, industries that are built because we are not able to, you know, cap- capitalize on, you know, our own creativity and our own entrepreneurial ideas. So let's put a pen right there. Structure. I want to talk about the hair piece right okay. now. First of all, I just cut all my hair off. <laughs> I don't want to be even involved with hair. You don't have to have hair to, to be uh, making billions of dollars from it. The, the Korean community proves that every day. Well, you see, you <laughs> took my thought right out of my head. That's exactly what I was going to say. Now, you know, for many, many years, you know, a lot of my former colleagues hated on the Asian community because they pimp off of us, blah, blah, blah. And I said at the top of the show that I admire them. Because they do seize the moment. And so, you know what? They saw hair. Why weren't we making our own hair? Right. You know? I mean, what they did was they got hold of the idea that we liked their hair better and were Mm -hmm. weaving it and doing whatever. So someone over there in one of their countries, I'm not sure where they produce that hair, in China, wherever, Mm -hmm. but they decided they would lock us out. Yeah. And and that's what they did. They locked us out. So you know what? We can't dislike it and not, and you know what? You don't like it, don't wear the hair. Yeah. Don't wear it. Well, well, we can compete. I mean, the thing about it, it's like what we were saying earlier about business. uh, It's very difficult in today's time, you know, to be a uh, solopreneur, you know, a sole, you know, a one person operation, even if you're operating that way, which is really where most black businesses are. I mean, 95% of black businesses according to the uh, the census bureau have are, are sole proprietorships you know you only have you know one employee and you're talking about you know according to the latest numbers like 1.9 million black businesses across the country um 95 percent of them like i said are sole proprietorships but even with that that shows that you just created a job for yourself. So even if it is a sole proprietorship, you're not out looking for a job. You're out. You're actually building on your passion, and you're able to make enough money, you know, to keep yourself, uh, you know, employed, self-employed, and also you re- you reduce a lot of stress because there are a lot of people working for companies right now, probably listening to the sound of my voice, who are stressed out because they got to come in there on Monday to Friday, sitting somewhere where you know where they don't really don't like being, and they could if they could take their passion and turn that into a way to produce income for themselves, just. Just, even if they did, even if they made seventy five to ninety percent of what they make right now in their job, they probably would leave. So that's one that's one reality in terms of this whole you know entrepreneurial mindset. So I I, I think that that's that that in, a, in itself is a big benefit of you know working on becoming uh, more entrepreneurially minded. Two one five six three four eight zero five. No, 8065-215-634-8065. You know, our listeners should jump in on this. I know that during this day part, a lot of our listeners are uh, a little more elderly. They might be a little more conservative. They might not think about venturing out or encouraging their young people to venture out. And like I said, I am not telling anybody, don't try to get a job. But always have something else in your hip pocket. But you can know? I add? Can I add this? Well, here's the and here's the, here's the thing um, too. As a as a community, because a lot of what we have to do, you know, in today's time is, you know, move collectively. Even though we may not like it, we don't have to. Because again, you can't work by yourself. Because even even if you're trying to work by yourself. It's, business is so complex today. Uh, like I talk with small business owners all the time, and, and most of them, even if they have that passion, they don't understand, let's say, uh, how to market. You know, so they need in today marketing. This is social media marketing. You know, and, and that so you got to be on Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, uh, YouTube, right? So that, so that's a whole a- area. Then you got your bookkeeping. Then you got uh, you know you got your legal issues. You got your compliance. So there's, so there's so many facets to business that you have to develop up a team even if you're doing it as that sole proprietor you so can means, outsource all of that exactly so that means you got to have a business plan in mind you got to have a, a strategy in mind and then you got to find ways to connect and to those people to outsource them or barter with people but the point is you're not going to be able to say it's just going to be me i'm not going to interact with any of these other people i'm just going to do it and i'm gonna keep all the knowledge in my head myself to do all of this so you're going to have to work together and that means that you need to join some type of collective whether it's you know the african-american chamber of commerce whether it's the uh you know uh, oic whether it's uh, namd you know you got to get into how do we work together because often when i talk to entrepreneurs they they're thinking 
they're so busy, I can't do this, I'm, you know, and they got their nose through the grindstone, and they're not networking, they're not building these relationships. And as far as, like, the, the, the seniors, uh, one of the fastest growing segments on the Internet right now is really, the you know, the 55-plus market, you know, and certainly, like, that's one of the advantages. I mean, if you can go on, you know, even on, you go on Facebook, you see a lot of people 55-plus on Facebook is a fast-growing segment. Are you saying that 55-plus is old? <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm old down product. A demo. Okay, I'm yeah, saying, cool. I'm saying a demo. The, the, you know, you have if you if you're going to market, I often say you got to target your market. Cause you, one of my, you know, you can you can you can get rich in a niche. So you can know. I'm not, I never I, I never injected the you know a, 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 a qualifier. I'm just saying for people. <laughs> no, but Don't for real, to for get me in trouble if I tell you No, you're getting in trouble with me. But no, for real, for real. My mom looked at me the other day and she said, "Okay, so." You're about to be middle aged. I was like, no, mom, I am middle aged. Let's like face it. You know, I don't know no, that I'm going to. That's a that's a high. We're talking business. That's a high demographic. Exactly. Fifty five to sixty four, sixty five to seventy four. You have to look at what your product is. You have to look at what the needs are. I mean, hey, that that is a growing demo with the baby boomers. You know, moving on into different age categories as an entrepreneur and saying, where is the opportunity? You got to that that that's what these multi-billion dollar corporations are doing. That's why, why you think you're seeing Viagra ads? Why you think you're seeing people with all these ads they want to stay young and blah, blah, blah? These companies, they look at, like you said about the Asian community, they look at this thing as a business. They move the emotion out. They don't care when they come into the community and open up that Korean beauty supply store right next door to the mosque. It ain't personal with them. It's business. And that's what, you know, entrepreneurship is about. I remember this guy used to have this saying, he said, um, can you fire your mama? <laughs> if you have to, you know what I mean? that's the entrepreneurial. That's part of the entrepreneurial mindset. Mom, mom may not be the best bookkeeper for your business. Can you fire him? That, that's and that's hard. But that that is the business. And a lot of times we get into business on emotion. Oh, that's my friend. I went to college with. Oh, that's my girl. Oh, blah. blah. And but they're not qualified to do the business. And that's and that's what we're talking about. We're not. We're never going to compete with other people who are really focused on the bottom line, economic value, the opportunity, the market, if we come in it just from a pure emotional side and we just want to be nice people and get along. We need to take a break. When we come back, we have Sandra from Germantown joining us here on WURD 900 AM. We're back, and you're listening to 900 AM WURD. The number here is 215-634-8065, and if you would like to call toll-free, it's 1-866-361-0900 on 900 AM WURD. Sandra from Germantown is calling. Thanks for joining us here on Word. Good afternoon, and thank you for taking my call. Thanks. I, I love your uh, subject today. Uh, there's something interesting you said about the um, the wigs and things that the um, Asian people are selling, and they have locked us out of the uh, market. Now, how do we get into that market? Of creating and marketing the hair? Which I hate. Uh, yeah, I, I do too. I don't know how we get into that market. I know there was an African American brother who decided he was going to do this, and he did find a way to tap into it. But I don't know his name. Somebody else does that's I, out there listening. Yeah, I, I can speak to that. Yeah, who I mean, was there's, that? There's a few. There's a few ways to get in. You're talking about um, Terry Briggs, okay. who was here in Philly, and he's still here. And, and he um, had Jaguar Luxury uh, brand that he started. He went over to China and actually took a few people. Over, he was doing some um, back and forth trips there. There's also a group called BOBSA, B O B S A, which is the Black Owned Beauty Supply Association, uh, Sam Enon's group. They're out of San Francisco. And there's another brother down in Atlanta, um, uh, Devin Robinson, um, you know, who started something called the Beauty Supply Institute. So those are like three um, people, um, you know, that are working actively, uh, you know, to help get in. And there's another group out in St. Louis as well. Um, but certainly, if you email me, uh, my email is norm at normbond.com. You know, I can help um, definitely point you uh, in that area. Because I've also, through NAMD, we did several sessions on the business of black hair. And it is, just, and you know, of course, the Chris Rock movie came out, you know, which brought a lot of attention, you know, to it. And then there's a sister out in uh, L.A. as well. Um, who has a, uh, a a big thing she's doing called My Nappy Roots, uh, which I definitely would encourage people to check out, My Nappy Roots, 
and and uh, she actually sued Chris Rock when he came out with that movie for stealing her uh, for uh, stealing her idea uh, or parts of it. But, Did she win? Uh, they no. They pulled her. They they pulled her case uh, because of because of the cost. She couldn't. You know when you she was suing. You know I think it was Paramount uh, or HBO. And uh, <laughs> she didn't stand a chance. She didn't stand a chance. And she and, didn't and have she, deep she, pockets. No. She tried to file an injunction to stop the movie from you know being from coming out, uh, which they uh, denied her injunction. But even when you push that, then you you know you got to pay for that. You know, there's money for that. But what she's yeah, doing court now, fees, couriers, legal fees, lawyers, all of that absolutely. stuff. Absolutely. But 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 my nappy, what she's doing now is she has the film. I've actually seen the trail. I've actually shown shown parts of the film. But she's actually now going around the country showing you know the film, doing screenings, and it's a it's a much more actually in depth film about the business of hair and the culture of hair than what we saw with Chris Rock. So, well, his you know. was a brief documentary. I found it entertaining. I had no idea. Oh, yeah. Uh, I, I had no idea uh, what was going on with, uh, you know, the vats of the hair straightener and all that kind of stuff, because I haven't had chemicals in my hair since I was like 12. Yeah. But, um, you know, when you think about how here's a whole community, speaking of, you know, the Asian community that has capitalized on hair for so many years after Madam C.J. Walker became the first black female, you know, millionaire off of hair. It's just, it's heartbreaking. Thank you for calling. Camila is on her mobile phone. I don't want to keep her uh, waiting too long. Thanks for joining us here on WURD. Peace and blessings. Peace to you too. Um, I wanted to say, I'm talking about establishing businesses, which I don't um, usually hear people bring up the fact that you can go to a um, business that functioning people are ready to get out of their businesses and you can buy their businesses and you can negotiate it with the business owner like you could possibly buy the building if they own the building and you could buy the business from the owners um a lot of people don't talk about that in the black community because i was a person who did it with a partner some years ago and it was uh dealing with pharmaceuticals but it, you can do that, but you have to find maybe a broker or something that delves in that, into that kind of thing, and you might not need as much money. You might not have to go to the bank, so on and so forth. So I just wanted to add that, so that was a bit of information that we could use. Thank you and so much. If you all could speak on it a little bit, maybe you know something about it, okay? And I'll hang up. Thanks, Camila. Norm? Yeah, acquisitions and mergers, I mean, is a big way to grow businesses, you know, in terms of going to scale and making them bigger. Um, the, the issue becomes, you know, one, just making sure you have the upfront capital, you know, to acquire the business from that existing owner. Another opportunity, another area is franchising. I mean, actually, when you talk about, you know, successful businesses, uh, most franchises have like an 80% and above success rate. I mean, you still got to check them out, but they're giving you more of a, I'm going to say a cookie cutter approach, you know, they, they want to they, you don't have to, cutter. you don't have to be creative. In, yeah, 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 and then and you and you come in, you can say, hey, I'm going to you know, various, and there's all types of franchises. I mean, you can, you can go online, there's, there's thousands of different types of franchises other than the big ones that people think of that, you know, you can get in at different levels and you get more of a support system because you're following a structure, you know, you got, you're not going to have all of the, you know, individual individuality that you would have you know, but it can help you. And then sometimes you, once you grow that, you can sell that franchise. But certainly acquisitions is a good way. I think the issue uh, that we're seeing when you have 95% of the black businesses as sole proprietors is that people are just getting started. And these businesses are small. I think, um, you know, average receipts is like uh, under $100,000. You know, it's basically they're creating a job. But certainly, I mean, I would encourage that. And also partnership, because maybe you can get, you know, three or four people to come together, um, you know, work together and say, we're going to uh, acquire a company, but again, you got to do your research and you got to have some business skills, and, and you, know, you got to have some money. <laughs> you got to have some money or some good credit or some some re something, some assets that you can use that can um, you know be be collateral. So, um, and you got to have the mindset again. Of, of, I want to acquire a business. That's that's how actually a lot of Koreans and, and others actually you know they will come into the neighborhood and they will go into these black owned court mom and pop stores and they buy them. You know, they give them twenty grand or. 50 grand, 80, whatever, and they acquire those businesses. You come back now, a lot of people haven't been back into the community in a while. They drive through their old neighborhood and they're looking at stores that used to be black owned and now they're Dominican or they're Korean or something else. And often, you know, someone came in 
and acquired that business from that existing owner. So I, I recommend it if you can if you can do that. It's a good strategy, but do your research. Ogbana is calling from South Philly. Oh, I'm moving fast because we are <laughs> quickly out of time. But Ogbana, thank you for calling. all right. How how you doing? Um, you know, I wanted to ask a question about the um, the event yesterday, uh, the the green event with uh, Van Jones. Uh, this is not the same event. I don't no, know. No, I, no, I was just. Uh, I don't know. Was, I don't know. I mean, I knew it was happening, but I don't know anything about it. Okay, because here's one of the things that I wanted to mention uh, in terms of the green economy. Right. There is a lot of money in recycling. Yes. There's a lot of money in recycling, and if anybody who's interested in recycling, they can contact me if I'm allowed to give my number. Would I you? Can show them. Absolutely. It's millions and millions of dollars in recycling in America. Go. At 267-257-9119. Mm-hmm. And the name of my uh, company is Philly Word Green. And again, it will. I can show anybody who calls me how to develop money and make money from recycling. And don't have to have any money up front. Uh, to, any uh, money. I personally have an idea of, I'm like a huge recycler in my house, and um, I have a thing, I'm not going to put it out there, because let me just say this, whenever you have an idea, at least a hundred other people have the same idea, okay? So keep the idea to yourself until you actually have it flying, because somebody out there is going to take your idea if you don't move on it. But you'll hear from me, um, it's 267-257-9119. Yes, can I just say something real quick? The, the the thing about recycling is, to me, what I found is that I can tell a thousand people about it, and it still will be enough for me. And it'll still be enough for that thousand, because we live in the most wasteful society on the planet. You did not lie there, honey. I'm okay, telling you, for real. can be recycled. I gotta go. If anybody's interested, please call me. You'll hear from me. Thank you. Shamaya on her cell phone. Yeah, good afternoon. How's everyone? Good afternoon. How are you? I'm doing well, thank you. I, I hope I'm saying these names right. Yes, Shemaya, Shemaya Bay. Okay. All right, I had a question. I was inquiring about, uh, you know how the uh, bodegas on the court for the corner stores, uh, do they get special grants or any city tax breaks for um, immigrants coming into the community? And if so, uh, can you point, uh, I guess, regular African Americans in that direction for paperwork? Norm? Um, the city would say no to that. Um, there is... The Commerce Department, you know, I would direct people to, um, to well, before I would, I would, I mean, I'll put the Commerce Department out there, but I would really direct you to the African American Chamber of Commerce. I mean, they've got some new leadership there. Um, they can help you with, uh, they're doing a, a certification. Now, you know, the city has changed with this whole Office of Economic Opportunity. Um, and, and in terms of these businesses that you see in those corridors, the commercial corridors, um, often what happens is their paperwork is tight. I mean, they will come in. Uh, they go there is a if you go to the commerce department and you go to OEO uh, what happens is a lot of those immigrants when they come into the country one they specifically want to locate in the, the inner city they don't want to be out in the greater northeast so is that because it's cheap and they have a captive market they have a captive market they know that they know black people want to buy from them mm-hmm. period I mean right. that's really what it is and they have and they also have about you know three or four different commerce department is it's almost like a cookie cutter like they don't come over uh you know and, and, and isolate it you know so often like that's why when you come into some of the stores you'll notice the staff will change like after a period of a few months and, they, and, and and you'll see and the same happens with the with the beauty supply stores like they bring people in they work they learn the, the business and then they help them acquire their own store but they have the money up front they work collectively so it seems like they're getting breaks but you know, you if when you organ a lot of those breaks come through organization, through working together, and through shared sacrifice. So, um, you know, and, and also they do have ways of, of raising money outside outside of the traditional sources. I mean, they will do these things where they'll each you know five of them will come together and say, hey, we're gonna all put in a thousand dollars this month, and they'll, so they got five thousand, and you get the five thousand this month, and the next month they do the same thing, and the second person gets the five thousand, and third, and and that, but again, that's trust. If they're not using the you know traditional banking sources, often they you know they work together like that, and these are things that for the black community, um, you know, we could do, but. It takes changing your mindset. You know, uh, 
I, I just want to interject this. You you mentioned earlier you were talking about social media and how people have to use it. Uh, I write a column for the Philadelphia Daily News every other week. And yesterday my column was on prayer in school. You know, the idea that we need to get prayer, a moment of meditation or whatever. And that was supposed to be my topic today. I put that out on Facebook and that conversation went on for three days. <laughs> and so I changed topics because I wanted City Councilwoman Janie Blackwell to come on the air with me and talk about her um, goal to have hearings. She chairs uh, the Education Committee and so she wanted to have hearings because her constituents have been asking to get prayer reinstated in the schools. So to anybody who wanted to call about that, the reason I didn't was because I didn't think it was a good idea to talk about the hearings that Councilwoman Janie Blackwell wants to have about the possibility of prayer in school without her. So if I can catch up to her by next week, hopefully we will have that t- as another hot button, button topic. Uh, but I knew that business, too, and entrepreneurship in this economy would fly today because there are so many people like me, like Tiffany, we are struggling. And it's not for lack of of talent or lack of wanting to work, it's circumstances. So we're changing our mindsets about being entrepreneurs and, uh, you know, for lack of a better word, hustling. Um, Norm, a couple of years ago, I wrote a column that, boy, man, I still get stuff back on this column about taking crack dealers off the corners and sending them to Wharton. Now, it was pie in the sky, I know. But the point was, if you've ever watched how drug dealers hustle, and I've watched them on the corner, and I see them stash the drugs in the planters, and they, you know, they've got a whole thing going. They've got the uniforms, the white T-shirt, and all that. If you took those skills and put them into viable businesses, it'd be yeah. a go. Yeah, and that, and, it's, and that's a big hey, it's a big market, and you show them something legit, um, and hopefully you know those are the, those people will come out. I mean, there are people, uh, there are resources out here. This is why you know I would encourage people to go to um, you know the website oicofamerica.org because that's to help with that mindset. And then also, um, I think that if you you know most people even if they're making that money out there, you know the guys on the corner, girls on the corner. They're, they're like pawns in the game. You're not really, you know, you're not really, uh, you're a foot soldier, really. So the point of it is, but you take a huge risk. Even the money that you make, you know, at any time your door can be kicked in at night. You can be, you know, locked up all of these, now with all the RICO stuff. You can be, all your, everything that you think you're building can be snatched away. So I often say, yeah, you're absolutely right. If someone like that who has that, uh, you know, the, the drive, they're willing to, you know, approach people and they're willing to, you know, basically cold call. Certainly, if you put them in an environment that was structured and legit, that could be uh, a way for them to make their money in a legal way. And that's what we want to encourage, because a lot of them, a, a, a disproportionate percentage, unfortunately, turn out to be African-American because we don't have as many alternatives and options. And that's why it's good for us to work together collectively, share information, uh, share opportunities, help those of us who do have information on how to grow, build, develop businesses, work out and reach into that market and reach into that group and, and provide and provide that those skills to them. Real quick, because we've we're just about out of time, um, one thing, what does the National Alliance of Market Developers to become a member, what how would that benefit a business person? Um, well NAMD, uh, basically, it would benefit a person who's looking at either a national market or a local market uh, you, in terms of being able to, to network and able to be able to understand the history of marketing to get a lot of research data. I mean, NAMD was founded in 1952, so it was the first organization to quantify the spending of the African-American consumer market back in 1952. So research is a very important part of building a successful business and also Often it's a part that a lot of entrepreneurs overlook. You know, we don't have, you don't do the research. Um, often we just starting on guts and gumption. And also the other benefit of an NAMD is it plugs you into a national network, you know, of people in Chicago and New York, Philadelphia, and parts of the South, Los Angeles. So um, the website is NAMDNTL. Dot O-R-G. That's www.namdntl.org to get plugged in with NAMD, and we're going to be um, having an event in May uh, in New York. Final question. You've got about 30 seconds. Um, what are the hot trends out there for anybody that wants to go into business for themselves? 
Well, the brother hit on something with the green collar economy. Certainly, um, I, I would recommend Van Jones' mm-hmm. book, Green Collar Economy, if you're interested in the green, um, you know, because he breaks down a lot of those things and gives you some real world mm-hmm. things there. Social media, everything on the web, um, you know, is, is really um, um, hot in terms of being becoming an information provider about your niche because uh, you can then tell it through video, you can tell it through a blog. And uh, I'm actually doing a class at the African American Chamber on Thursday. Thursday evenings on is a class called Effective Social Media Marketing, and uh, you know you can contact uh, you can contact the chamber, you can contact me, but you can go to or go to my um, you know my website is normbond.com n o r m b o n d dot com, or you can give me a call you know directly two one five seven nine six zero two zero six two one five seven nine six zero two zero six but i would recommend you know everyone this is an information age uh think about becoming an entrepreneur uh and turning your business into something entrepreneurial thanks norm bond that's it we are flat out of time i appreciate you calling and uh sharing time with us today okay thank you Okay, and finally, that number uh, from Ogbana for recycling is 267-257-9119. Tiffany Gillum, always a pleasure working with you. I'm Fatima Ali. I'll talk to you next week, same time, same place, here at 900 AM WURD.